Hi, everyone. Nina and I are excited to be starting season two after a much needed rest. Welcome back to all of our regular listeners and welcome aboard to any new listeners who might be joining us for the first time. Season two is going to go by just as quickly as season one. Currently, we have 44 episodes planned with a possible bonus episode here and there. So many episodes to write in so little time. I think that so many, so little timeline would have been something you said in your younger days referring to men. (laughs) Nah, not me. Anyhow, today we're starting off in August of 1969. And yes, I know some of our listeners are chomping at the bit to move on to the 70s and beyond. But I promise we're almost done with the 60s. And we've had plenty of requests for episodes and lots of interest in Sunny Shields. Who knew Sunny Shields was so popular? Well, we will definitely have to honor those requests. This season will end in 1989, and hopefully enough of our listeners will stick around so we can cover the 90s and the early 2000s in Season 3. You'll all have to wait another year until we get to Lara's 21st birthday and the Gardner Museum eyes. And no, the paintings were not my birthday gift. Okay, enough of the chit-chat. We have 20 years to get through, so we better get started. I think we should briefly go back to 1968 and touch on two things that pertain to today's topic. Go for it. Some of our listeners might recall that in early 1968, Joe Barboza's attorney, John Fitzgerald, lost his leg while starting up Barboza's James Bond car. Supposedly, the bomb was planted to scare Barboza into not testifying against Raymond Patriarca and the other members of the New England Mafia and their associates. At the time, Patriarca, Henry Tamilio, and Ronnie Cassessa were on trial for the murder of Willie Maffeo, and the main prosecution witness, just like in the Teddy Deegan murder trial, was Joe Barboza. Tamilio and Cassessa had already been convicted of the Deegan slaying and sentenced to death row. After the bombing, the Willie Maffeo murder trial was briefly postponed. The following month, on March 7th, the case went to the jury when the defense rested after not calling a single witness. After four hours of deliberations, the jury returned guilty verdicts against the three men charged with conspiracy to commit murder. Raymond had been free on a $50,000 bond during the trial, and the judge allowed him to remain so until sentencing. Raymond's attorney, Joe Bellero, blamed the verdict on his client's notoriety. On March 25th, Raymond was sentenced to five years in the federal pen in Atlanta and fined $10,000. His two co-defendants received the same sentences, but considering they were doing life already, it didn't matter. Raymond was allowed to remain free pending appeal. Willie's brother, Rudy Maffeo, and Rudy's driver, Anthony Malay, were gunned down in Pannoni's Market just a little less than a month later on Saturday, April 20th. The first person to be picked up was Robert Almonte. On Monday, May 28th, 1968, Almonte was arrested at his social club on Atwell's Ave in Providence, Rhode Island, the same club where back in early April, the Providence PD had arrested Louis Minocchio, Rudy Schiara, Johnny Rossi, and Dickie Calais after they received a phone call that the boys were lying in wait for Joe Schiavone. Louis and the others were charged with illegal possession of firearms. Almonte was charged with possessing gambling paraphernalia, but all the charges were dropped soon after. Well, this time Almonte wasn't so lucky. The following day on May 28th, Almonte was arraigned for the murders of Rudy Maffeo and Anthony Malay. He pleaded not guilty and was held without bail. I have to interrupt myself for a moment to say that one of our listeners told us the proper way to pronounce Maffeo, Maffeo, I believe, but Nina and I are so used to pronouncing it the wrong way that I'm not sure we can correct ourselves, so please don't be angry at us. Okay, back to 1968. While Amante was being charged, Rudy Schiara, Pro Learner, and Jack Kelly were in Methuen riding in Pro's car when they heard the news on the radio. Since they were chatting away during the announcement, all they caught was that someone had been pinched, but not who. Jack would later tell the feds that they were all concerned that Bobby Fairbrothers was the one who had been picked up. Pro found a payphone in order for Schiara to call someone back in Providence to get the details. When Schiara returned to the car, he reported that it was Almonte who was hauled in. According to Jack, Schiara said that Almonte was an asshole for wanting to be a hitman, and Almonte had been running around Federal Hill bragging that he was the one responsible for the Maffeo Malay hit. If Almonte wanted to play gangster, he could pay the price. How many people have we heard this same story about wanting to be a hitman? It sounds like another fed fantasy to me. 
Mm-hmm. The feds asked Jack if it might have been El Monte who called Minocchio to alert the shooters that Marfeo was in Pannoni's on the day of the hit. Jack told them that El Monte definitely was not the one who had called from the drugstore. Jack said that Louis Minocchio told him that it was a bookie whose name Jack couldn't recall. And no, I don't buy that Jack couldn't recall who the caller was. Well, good, because neither do I. <laughs> On May 31st, El Monte's hair sample was sent to be compared with those found in the getaway car. The match was inconclusive, but his sample couldn't be ruled out. Herbert Simone was the attorney general of Rhode Island at that time. A hearing was set for July 2nd, but before it took place, El Monte's attorney managed to have bail set at $130,000. His sister posted bail, and he was released during the July 2nd hearing. Meanwhile, on August 1st, 1968, Raymond, Tamilio, and Cassesso were indicted in state court, this time for the July 1966 murder of Willie Maffeo. They all pleaded innocent to the charges. In October, Rudy Schiara, Bobby Fairbrothers, and Ronaldo de Pedro Antonio were indicted for the murder of Luis Aglio back on February 4th, 1967. Zaglio was supposedly killed because of a beef he had with Alfredo the Blind Pig Rossi, the father of Johnny Rossi, who we mentioned in the season one finale. Also indicted for inciting the murder were Louis Minocchio and Louis Taglianetti. To wrap up the month, Raymond, Henry, and Ronnie lost their federal appeal. In January of 1969, federal judge Francis J.W. Ford ordered Raymond to begin serving his sentence and off to Atlanta he went. Finally, in May of 1969, Al Monte's trial began. The state claimed two masked men gunned down Rudy Maffeo and Anthony Malay, but only Bobby Al Monte was on trial. Several people testified on his behalf, saying that he was at the social club that he ran on Atwell's Ave at the time of the double slaying. However, two of Malay's relatives testified that they saw him in the vicinity of Pannoni's that morning. Well, the jury must have been swayed by the testimony of Malay's family. On May 29, 1969, Almonte was convicted of the murders of Rudy Maffeo and Anthony Malay. And in a normal world, the case would have ended there, but not in New England. <laughs> if you listen to the season one finale, you'll recall that Jack Kelly was arrested on May 14th, just two weeks prior to Almonte's conviction. On June 6th, he turned state's evidence, and the tale of who killed Rudy Maffeo and Anthony Malay would take on a whole new life. If you want to hear more about Jack's statements to the Fed regarding the maffeo Malay hit, please listen to episode 47 from last season. All summer long, while in the safe hands of the U.S. Marshals, including John Partington, Jack began to dole out his own version of justice. He provided details of both crimes committed and planned, but oddly enough, none that he actually committed. Although he did place himself at the golf course behind Louis Minocchio's house during the Maffeo Malay hit. True, but considering the number of heists he was involved in, it was unusual that he never copped to one he actually com- committed. Most notably, the Plymouth mail robbery was absent from his statements. Well, at a later date, Sonny D'Aferio tried to confess to it. Not now. Okay, okay. Besides the Maffeo Malay hit and the Brinks robbery from December of December, From December of 68, Jack gave statements and grand jury testimony against Ben Tilly and Charles Domenico for the VA robbery. And more importantly, he told a grand jury that Jerry Angelo laundered the money from the VA heist. We won't be covering that today. Jack didn't limit his justice to Massachusetts and Rhode Island. He also gave testimony against Carlo Gambino, Butchie Maselli, and Pro Lerner. Jack claimed that they were planning to take down an armored car service in New York for three to five million dollars. Gambino and Butchie wouldn't be arrested until March of 1970, and like the VA, we will not be covering that case today. The Fed's immediate concern was the Maffeo Malay hit and the ITAR case that they were building. Keeping Raymond in prison seemed to be their priority. The Maffeo Malay murders wouldn't, could not fall under their jurisdiction if the hitters had not crossed state lines, so Jack's testimony that he and Pro had traveled to Rhode Island and Sciara and Minocchio had traveled to Massachusetts was crucial for their case. If only locals were responsible for the double homicide, the Fed's case would be dead in the water. And since they barely had a case to begin with, they desperately needed Jack's testimony. 
According to an FBI 302 dated July 30, 1969, Jack described Pro Lerner as the most dangerous man he had ever known in his more than 25 years of criminal activity, and Pro appeared to relish murder. Jack claimed that Pro was involved in several homicides, but he also said that Pro was extremely bright and courageous. I don't believe there was any truth to Jack and Dad's story about them being afraid of Pro. I can only judge by conversations I heard over the years. Not once did I hear anything bad about Pro. The guys, including Dad, mostly talked about him looking like Rock Hudson, being a health nut, busting Dad's chops about being Jewish and how Pro liked to break balls in general, including delivering an obese prostitute to Dad's front door in the middle of the night. (laughs) More fiction. We'll get more into that later in season two. For sure. All right. The U.S. attorney decided on July 25th that charges would be brought against Pro, Schiara, Minacchio, Rossi, Venditulli, and Fairbrothers, both in federal court and by the Rhode Island authorities. On August 7th, the Rhode Island Attorney General DeSimone, Suffolk County DA Garrett Byrne, Federal Prosecutor Walter Barnes, and the Boston FBI SAC Handley met to discuss the planned arrests and how they would be handled by the FBI rather than local authorities. On August 11th, a memo was sent from J.H. Gale to Deloche, which read, quote, it is expected that our informant under immunity will testify in detail as to this matter before the federal grand jury on August 14th and on the following day will be brought to Providence to testify in local court in order that murder indictments may be obtained against the subjects, end quote, the informant being Jack Kelly, of course. Okay, so now let's finally get to the arrests. When we left you at the end of last season, we told you that Richie met with Pro Lerner and the other suspects while crammed into Pro's car in the parking lot of the rib room in Braintree on (laughs) August 8th. Pro and the other men told Richie that they had a plan to kill Jack along with the U.S. Marshals and both of Richie's FBI handlers, Special Agents Rico and Komen. What we didn't tell you was that Richie didn't bother to tell his handlers this tale until after Pro had been apprehended. It's just so dad. According to the story that I know from dad, the meeting happened and part of the discussion, of course, was about Jack and what he potentially had on each of them. But the murder plot tale was Rico's guarantee for a ticket out of town. To the sunny beaches of Florida. (laughs) Exactly. Dad waited for the arrest to go down to prevent any extra drama. The tale was designed to torment Coleman and to ensure Rico's wish for this fun in the sun, which would make his way all the way up to J. Edgar Hoover's desk. Well, I believe that entirely. Warrants were issued on August 11th for Fairbrothers, Schiara, Minacchio, Venditoli, Patriarca, and Pro Lerner. The following day, the arrest began. Pro was the second to be picked up. You finally get to tell the story about how they broke Coleman. (laughs) Finally. Just two days prior to the seventh anniversary of the Plymouth Mail robbery on the morning of August 12, 1969, Pro was arrested. Special agents Gerard Coleman, Raymond Ball, and John Sweeney were part of the team of feds and Brookline police that arrested Pro at his home on Verndale Road in Brookline, Massachusetts, that he shared with his parents, his three sisters, his wife, and two children. The authorities arrived at roughly 6 a.m. and Pro answered the door in his boxer shorts and asked permission to put some pants on. Special Agent Komen escorted Pro to his bedroom alone. When Pro opened the closet, closet, Komen observed a brown leather case in close reach of Pro, which appeared to have a gun butt protruding from it, at which time Komen reached for the case, which contained a forty-five caliber pearl-handled pistol with one round in the chamber and a fully loaded clip, a Savage 77E 12-gauge pump-action shotgun that was unloaded, and two empty handgun boxes. In my imagination, this is like a frat boy thing. There's the one guy that nobody really likes because he's a Boy Scout and he's the butt of all the jokes. So they sent Gerard in there alone with a man they all believed was a serial killer. Hello. You remember that according to Frankie Salemi, Rico took a drop piece from him to kill Georgie McLaughlin with, but at the last minute aborted the plan because he didn't trust Coleman to go along with it. No doubt Rico still had a resentment against Coleman for that. 
The feds used Gerard's observations to get a warrant from the local police in Brookline to search Pro's home. Captain May reported to the feds that the basement was being used as a shooting gallery and various caliber slugs were removed from the beams and the walls of the basement. Coleman must have been shitting himself. That story would be repeated by more than a few informants over the years as if it was their firsthand knowledge. But my favorite part of the tale is that Pro told the feds that he had attended the Church of Scientology in Los Angeles and that he study the philosophy of life <laughs> seriously <laughs> talk about a ball breaker at least they got the part right about him being a former u.s marine <laughs> he was screwing with the feds and they reported it like he was being serious i wish i could have witnessed that exchange the man had a great sense of humor totally back to the morning of august 12th just before pro was pinched Robert Fairbrothers was arrested at 548 in the morning in Providence without incident. When advised of his rights by the feds, he refused to sign off on the standard form and asked to speak to his attorney. The unemployed 32-year-old wasn't the only Providence guy to be scooped up that day. At 9.10 a.m., Johnny Rossi was arrested on Atwell's Ave, also without incident. He, too, declined to sign off and requested to call the same attorney as Fairbrothers had. Attorney Robert S. Cerisi represented them, and bail was set at $150,000 each for Fairbrothers and Rossi. Pro was brought to the U.S. Commissioner David Nelson's office, where bail was also set at $150,000. His attorney was Gerald Alch, partner of F. Lee Bailey. Unable to make bail, Pro was transferred to the custody of the U.S. Marshals, but not before getting a shot in at RICO. One of my favorite lines. As Pro passed Rico in the hallway, he quipped, you look just like your photograph. But here's the best part about that. Dad hadn't told the feds the tale yet, but Rico knew it was coming because he helped concoct it, according to Dad. So the kicker is, is that Rico had to look shocked and concerned, and obviously Pro was privy to some of that plot. Well, no shortage of drama. <laughs> Later that evening, Richie met with Komen and Rico at the Children's Museum, which at the time was located in Jamaica Plain, not far from his home. And that's when he sprung the tale of the murder plot on them. <laughs> the infamous rib room story. Richie's excuse for not coming forward earlier was that he claimed that he felt his life would have been in jeopardy, but now with pro-incarcerated, he felt that it was safe. You can't, you have to imagine that Komen was in that car dying. But anyhow, even good old J. Edgar Hoover took a personal interest in dad's story, sending a memo to the sack in Boston the next day, asking that he give Rico security his personal attention and ensure adequate protection is afforded to Rico and his family. Four special agents were assigned to protect Rico and his family around the clock. In addition, Rico was instructed not to contact his CIs alone, but the two other agents accompany him at all times. Another teaser for the next episode. With Laura's favorite, Frankie Salemi star. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly the plot works since J. Edgar Hoover bought it hook, line, and sinker. Another one of Dad's fuck with the feds plans. One of many over the decades. Hoover also wanted to know if they could put Richie on the stand to testify about the plot to kill Rico. <laughs> there was also a question of whether the U.S. attorney would agree to give Richie immunity and protective custody. <laughs> Richie played it up and said he'd consider testifying, but only if he and his family were given protection and relocated afterward. Well, needless to say, that never happened. In the meantime, the authorities were searching for Frank Ventatulli, Rudy Schiara, and Louis Minacchio. Their friends and family members were questioned as to their whereabouts. And when Socket Man offered to give up Schiara's location in exchange for two grand... Three days later, on August 15th, Sciarra was apprehended in a pre-dawn raid at the residence of Joseph Ambrogio and Upton Mass by Assistant Special Agent Rampton, Special Agent Kehoe, Sweeney, Ring, and Ball, who found him sleeping in a first-floor bedroom. Special Agent Ball advised Sciarra of his rights, but like Fairbrothers and Rossi, he refused to sign off. After his arraignment, a hearing was scheduled for August 25th. Like Pro Learner, Schiaro was transferred by the marshals to the Worcester County House of Correction. Well, you'll notice that Keo just had to be there for that one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> In case anyone was wondering, the conviction against Robert Almonte was cleared after his attorney filed for a motion for a new trial. Another name to add to the list of the wrongfully convicted. 
or not, we'll get into our theories about who the real murderers might have been, or more accurately, who they most likely weren't later on, and Al Monte will be making more appearances this season. The same day that Skira was arrested, Pro's bail was decreased to $50,000. Doesn't it strike you as strange that his family didn't use the 87 Verndale Street property to secure the bond for Pro's release? Well, it's very strange considering that his father owned the property, but maybe Alch advised Pro and his family that it was pointless. Oh, probably. Skiara had no problem making bail. He was released on August 19th on $50,000 surety bond. He was also represented by Cerisi. But not for long. He was promptly rearrested by Rhode Island authorities and sent to ACI Howard to face several other charges. The previous day, Rossi and Fair Brothers had both been released on $40,000 surety each, and they too were rearrested and shipped off to Howard. Let's backtrack a couple of days to when Skiara was pinched. Frank and Bruglia was stopped just after midnight at the intersection of Social Street and Diamond Hill Road in Woonsocket, Rhode Island, by ASAC Rampton and Special Agent Keogh, as they believed he knew the location of Skiara. Of course, he wasn't in Imbruglia's car, but Imbruglia did know where Skiara was, and that's how the feds made their way to Ambrogio's house in Upton. The feds knew they had no grounds to hold Imbruglia, but their bluff paid off. He would also later confess to having rented a motel room for Rudy in Revere, Mass. In the meantime, Dad was busy with his disinformation campaign. On August 24th, he met with Special Agents Coleman and Welby at their usual meetup spot, the Old Children's Museum. Dad told them that on August 20th, Pro's wife had come to our family store on Charles Street in Boston. According to his tale, Attorney Alch told Rini, who's Pro's wife, to see Pro, who was by then being held at the Dedham House of Correction. Pro told his wife to relay to Dad that after his bail hearing, that he would look for a new attorney. And that's how he ended up with Ronnie Chisholm. Exactly. Anyone who wants to hear a little bit more about Ronnie's early days should listen to episode 26, The Defense Never Rests. Rini or Frank Capizzi would contact Dad to tell him who the attorney would be, and Dad would then falsify documents regarding the Maffeo Malay murders. Supposedly, part of the statements would include that Jack was testifying out of spite. Dad was to state that he had been Jack's driver for nearly a decade and that he was to testify about Jack's mental capacity. Well, lack of mental capacity was the implication. (laughs) (laughs) The Alzheimer's story had already been cooked up. Another teaser for later in the season. Richie also stated that he was to contact Stephen Jacobson, a close friend of Frank Capizzi and pro, if he needed money. Jacobson would then get the money from Louis Minocchio. What a twisted thread that was. But Richie had more. The story continued that Pro was worried that Roy Appleton, Paul Christie, and Billy Kenny would testify against him, so Pro was looking for someone to take them out. But I want to know who the hell Stephen Jacobson was. You got me. I asked you that, and you didn't know either. Clueless. Billy Kenny went on to own some Tony Beauty Salon in Wellesley. Christie was related to someone in the Rhode Island crew, and you figured out you figured that part out. And Roy eventually, you know, killed himself when he had because he had cancer. But I, I don't know who Jacobson was. What I do know is that Richie really didn't like Capizian and Bruglia. <laughs> no question about that. Now, here's where the story gets even nuttier. Supposedly, Rudy Schiara sent word up through Paul Christie that Billy Kenny was supposed to get whacked. Dad warned Kenny, who, according to Dad, was going to sell his boat, buy a Cadillac Eldorado, and take it on the lab. Yeah, like the Eldorado would go unnoticed. <laughs> And the tale gets wilder. Richie told the feds that, quote, that bastard learner got what he deserved, unquote. The feds asked him what he meant by that. Richie said that Pro was a sadistic killer who got his kicks off of watching people bleed. He said that Pro bragged to him how he shot Billy Aggie in the head with a forty-five while they had a casual conversation. That three hundred two has been quoted more times than I even want to think about. I'm surprised how many others claim that story is their own, but there's no shortage of liars in any of these tales. The following day on August 25th, Dad met with Welby and Coleman for a second time, but this time at Arby's Roast Beef on Route 1 in Detta. He wanted to report on a conversation he had on August 21st with Frank Capizzi and Stephen Jacobson in front of the Prudential Center in Boston. 
Why didn't he tell them about that meeting when he met with Welby and Coleman the day before? That makes no sense. Well, knowing Dad, it wasn't because they were pressed for time or something. It was because he hadn't concocted the story yet. The story goes that Jacobson excused himself and Capizzi sat in Dad's Chrysler station wagon. Dad actually used to call it a beach wagon. It belonged to the store. They used it to deliver the groceries. Anyhow, Capizzi told Dad that Menacchio had decided that Dad needed to get out of town until after the Maffeo Malay trial began. Capizzi also told him that Christie and Kenny were still in the hit parade and so was Imbruglia, but Imbruglia escaped death because his parole had been violated. And Richie had to retell one of his favorite <laughs> stories about what a great liar he was. <laughs> the story about how he went on the radio during the Plymouth mail robbery investigation and said he was a double agent for the postal inspectors in the feds. Oh, well, actually, Dad was a triple agent because he dragged Effie Bailey into that saga. If you want to hear about that, you can also find that story in the Defense Never Rests episode. I want to give a little more background on Frank and Bruglia since he will be back later in the season as one of the men involved in the attempted hit on Frankie Salemi in 1989. And he briefly appeared in season one. Exactly. If anyone listened to our three-part Teddy Deegan series, they might remember that Imbruglia's name appeared multiple times in the initial interviews regarding Teddy's murder. Imbruglia was running with Romeo Martin, a close friend of Teddy Deegan's, and a suspect in Teddy's murder. Both men had been arrested in 65 for kidnapping a Newton housewife in her own car and robbing her of $70,000 worth of jewelry and furs. Romeo Martin had been killed in July of 65. In October of that year, Imbruglia received a sentence of 7 to 10 years, and that was the conviction that he was on parole for when the Rhode Island authorities and feds were able to get him to give up Rudy Scarra's location. That parole violation likely saved his life, but it opened up an investigation into have his been, have as his ugh, my goodness, an investigation into his having been granted parole in May of sixty nine. Imbruglia made sure that he was arrested along with Rudy to make it look like he was forced to cooperate with the feds. The agreement with the FBI was that he would be released on bond and the charges for harboring Rudy would be dropped. He claimed that he had not known that Rudy was being sought by the FBI when he offered to help Rudy find a place to stay. The feds kept their end of the bargain and that's exactly what happened. In the meantime, on August 26, Jack Kelly was brought to the Rhode Island Superior Court to offer testimony at the state bail hearings of Sciara, Lerner, Fairbrothers, and Rossi. Pro offered the theory that Jack was testifying against him because Jack told Pro to kill Tommy Richards, and Pro refused. Jack, of course, denied the story. My favorite incident from that hearing involved Sciara. As the men were being led away for the afternoon recess, Rudy Sciara started cursing the Rhode Island assistant attorney, Richard Israel, yelling, I'll get you, you bastard. I'll see tears running down your face before this is over. He then punched the wooden door as he exited the courtroom and broke his right hand. Idiot. <laughs> when they returned from the break, Rudy's attorney had to ask the judge for permission to take Rudy to the hospital for x-rays <laughs> and a cast. <laughs> Richard Israel is still alive. I would love to get an interview with him. <laughs> I wonder if he can still remember all of that, probably. The four were returned to Howard and held without bail based on Jack's testimony. Let's not forget Raymond Patriarca was charged along with the others. Their trial wouldn't begin until March of 1970. We'll be discussing the trial in episode five. In the meantime, Louis Minocchio and Frank Venditulli were on the lam, which brings us to next week's episode, Taking It on the Lam. And it wasn't just those two. Mello Merlino, Mello Merlino was hiding out in order to avoid being arrested for the 1968 Brinks heist, which we covered in episode 46. And Frankie Salemi and Stevie Fleming also fled on the advice of H. Paul Rico for the car bombing of attorney John Fitzgerald. I can't wait until next week. Rico met with them supposedly with just Gerard as his backup. <laughs> we'll be covering their travels, adventures, and the many manhunts. Who didn't the feds interview? And, you know, Rico was, wasn't really supposed to be there in the first place with Stevie and Frankie, but that's a whole other story. Okay. And Louis Minocchio's journey will have its own episode the following week, Where in the World is Louis? Now, I haven't asked for reviews and all of those other things. We do need more YouTube subscribers. And guys, forgive our little flubs and stuff going on here. We've been lazy for six weeks. We got to get back in action here. <laughs> 
The link to our channel is in the show notes. Laura's trying to do slideshows for each episode moving forward. Trying. Thank you guys for listening. Bye. Bye.